so um, so I think kind of the breakout session today, we're going to be talking about learning phase trials. So I'm going to talk about the early learn phase, so phase one, a little bit about phase two, and then Valerie's going to talk more about phase two things. Um, so the slides uh, today owe quite a bit to some of my uh, colleagues at Barry Consultants, Jason Connor and Steve Rolio. I'm going to acknowledge them. Um, so the outline for uh, the talk today, I'll have a few introductory slides about just the overall process of drug development, so you can see where the topics for today kind of fit into that process. Um, I'll talk about phase one trials, um, kind of the traditional types of phase one trials that we see, as well as some of the more innovative phase one trials. And I'll touch a little bit on phase two, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about um, dose response modeling for the you know, dose finding trial. Um, doing response adaptive randomization where we start to um, allocate differently to patients um, who come into the trial early versus late. Um, I may briefly touch on early stopping, then I think Valerie's going to talk a little bit more about um, early stopping roles for futility and this kind of thing. Um, so diving in a little bit more to what the drug development process looks like. Um, in phase one, these are typically your first in human studies. Um, a lot of times these are being healthy volunteers who don't actually have the disease that you're ultimately targeting for your drug. Um, in some indications, especially oncology, um, you do typically enroll patients in phase one, um, but in a lot of other therapeutic areas, these are patients who do not have the disease. Um, in phase one, we're also talking about really, really small trials. So these are um, you know, 20 to 30 subject trials. This is not uncommon at all. Uh, the goal of these trials is really to gain some initial understanding about the dose, um, about toxicity issues, safety issues, and trying to identify the maximum tolerated dose um, and the dose range that you might carry forward into future trials. Uh, once you move into phase two, now you usually have a few more um, subjects to work with, maybe in the hundreds of subjects. Of course, depends a lot on the therapeutic area you're working in. Um, and the goal in phase two is to start to get some initial hints of efficacy. Um, in particular, you want to look at whether there's a dose response relationship and to continue studying side effects, adverse events. Um, and once you pass through phase two, phase three is really what we think of as the confirmatory phase, um, where you'll show benefit of your new treatment and typically regulators will require uh, two adequate and well-controlled trials um, for regulatory approval. Um, so this graphic is something that you will commonly see referred to as a rocket ship diagram, um, which gives the impression of how drugs move through the development process. Um, as you start over on the left, in the discovery phase, there's you know, hundreds of molecules or compounds that might be looked at. As you start to move into the clinical realm, the number of medicines drops off substantially. Um, and as you move through the clinical process, you see moving from phase one to phase two, a lot of compounds drop out for safety reasons, feasibility issues, um, lack of efficacy. Um, and by the time you move into phase three, really only a very small proportion of, of drugs that you started investigating will ever even reach phase three. Um, and then out of those, very few will, will make it um, successfully past phase three to approval. Um, so just to give you an idea of, you know, the, the magnitude of, of work that has to be done just to get one medicine to the market. Um, some challenges to the traditional approach in phase one, um, and we'll go into more detail about these in just a few moments. Um, so traditional designs in phase one are algorithm based. So we're gonna enroll a uh, small number of subjects, and then based on the result that we see, um, here's what we're gonna do, and it's a fixed decision rule. Um, these designs are easy to implement, um, but they're, they're not very flexible, um, and they don't make great use of the information. Um, and so when we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about model-based designs, um, which make better use of all of the information from the patients that you're enrolling, and have much better characteristics in terms of choosing the right dose. Um, and the model-based designs also offer a lot more customizability to answer the specific problem instead of just taking a can off the shelf design. When we get into phase two, um, one of the biggest challenges that we face is there's a lot of questions that we're trying to answer in phase two. 
So we, we go into phase two, maybe not knowing what the best dose is, maybe not knowing what the best population is, um, different schedules of treatment. Do I give this drug once a day or twice a day or once every three weeks? Um, sometimes you're, you're interested in different combinations of treatments. Um, and sometimes it might be the case that different combinations or different doses work better in one population and a different dose works better in a different population. Um, we have lots of questions that we would like to answer, um, and the reality is we just can't do a fixed trial over all of these possibilities. There's just too many. Um, so what typically happens when we're doing a phase two trial in the traditional approach is instead of looking at an entire dose range and trying to pick the best dose, we just pick two or three because that's how many we have resources, resources for. Um, so we just pick two or three, we cross our fingers and hope we pick the right ones, um, and we run our trial. So what we'll talk more about today is if we can consider some adaptations and some more innovative ways to approach phase two trials, um, we can have a better chance of answering multiple questions. So for example, um, instead of choosing just two or three doses, we can enroll patients across multiple doses or multiple durations, multiple treatment schedules, um, and then as the trial is going along, we stop enrolling um, patients that are unlikely to benefit. So if we start to recognize some populations are benefiting from the drug and some aren't, um, we can start to tailor down the population. Uh, we can start dropping arms that don't work or adjusting our randomization probabilities so that we put more patients on the arms that are performing better. Um, and what happens is that by the end of the trial, we start to focus on the, the patients that are most likely to benefit and on the doses or the treatment arms that are most likely to, to show a benefit. So this is kind of just a broad overview of where we're heading. Um, and we will see um, now a little bit more details. So phase one, the objectives of a phase one trial typically are looking at safety and tolerability. Um, these are typically the first trials that are run in humans, um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty going into the trial. Um, the main goal is to identify what we call the MTD, or the maximum tolerated dose, um, which will define what dose or doses get carried forward into the phase two trial. Uh, and another big part of the phase one is to assess pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The key elements of a phase one trial, um, first is picking what dose you're gonna start at. So these trials um, are typically going to be dose escalation trials. So you'll start by enrolling subjects at a low dose and wait until you've seen what kind of side effects um, might be present before enrolling anybody at a higher dose. Um, so one of the key things is gonna be what dose do you start at? And a lot of times that's driven by what you see in the animal models. Um, and since we often enroll in cohorts, you enroll a small number of, of, of patients at each arm sequentially, um, one of the key things is determining how big the cohort size needs to be. A lot of times this will be maybe three patients per cohort, um, something very small. And then you'll decide what events or what kinds of adverse effects um, would be defined as dose-limiting toxicities or DLTs. And these would be things that would go into the protocol as these are the kinds of adverse events um, that we're concerned about, that we will flag, um, and we want to make sure that um, we're not causing a high proportion of these events. Um, we'll define um, an acceptable level of, of DLTs. And again, this, this targeted toxicity level uh, is gonna vary depending on your treatment, um, depending on um, the benefit versus the risk here. So typically, we see this between 20 and 33%. Um, and then what you'll be looking for is what dose of your drug gets you close to that target toxicity level. So in terms of the strategies for phase one, there's kind of three big buckets. Um, Algorithm-based designs. Um, the most common of these is called a three plus three design. And I'll have a slide in a moment that kind of describes what that is. Um, and in these designs, the MTD is defined um, strictly as the number of subjects, or sorry, the dose um, on which fewer than, say, two out of six subjects have these dose-limiting toxicities. So it's this predefined pre um, based on a proportion of subjects. Model-based designs are gonna be a little more sophisticated. 
um, and going to fit a dose response relationship or dose toxicity curve, and then estimate your MTD as a quantile of that dose toxicity curve. Um, and then there's some models that are kind of hybrids between these, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those, but I will at least mention them. Uh, so the 3 plus 3 design, um, if you're not familiar with what that is, um, I've got a couple of graphics to just uh, illustrate that. So the idea is that you're going to enroll three subjects on a dose. This is your cohort. Um, if none of those three subjects have a dose limiting toxicity, then your next cohort of subjects will be escalated to the next highest dose level. If out of those three subjects that you enrolled, if more than one of them have a dose limiting toxicity, uh, then your next cohort of subjects will be enrolled at, and at the next lower dose. So you de-escalate. Um, if you're in the middle here, so if you have one out of those three that has a DLT, then you would enroll the next cohort of subjects at the same dose. So your decision is to stay there. And then what do you do after you've seen those next three subjects? Uh, so now if you've, you've got a DLT, you expand to six subjects. If you don't see any further DLTs and you still just have one out of the six, then you go up for your next cohort. Escalate again. Um, if you do see additional DLTs, then that's when you would de-escalate. So it's this algorithm-based thing. Um, and then you would continue this process essentially until you've either escalated all the way up to the top of your dose range, or any time you've got um, two, or two or more DLTs at any dose, um, that would trigger stopping the trial. Um, so you might have a design at the end of the trial that looks kind of like this. You can see we've got three subjects, no DLTs, and we just keep escalating up. Um, up at the top there, you can see once we got up to dose level five, um, we saw a toxicity out of the first three subjects, so then we expanded to six. We saw another toxicity, we dropped down. Um, so now we've got six patients at that dose level four, we saw two toxicities, we dropped back down. And now dose five, we have six subjects and no DLTs. So dose five would be, or sorry, dose three would be our, our maximum tolerated dose there. So in terms of the three plus three, um, it's you know this easy design for clinicians to understand and to implement. Um, you don't really need a statistician to be able to count how many DLTs you saw out of three patients. Um, but statistically, the weaknesses of this design are well documented in the literature. Um, and importantly is that the probability of stopping at an incorrect dose level is, is quite high. Um, these designs tend to be overly conservative and they tend to stop at a dose that's actually below the true MTD. Um, so what happens is you're, you're now carrying forward a dose that is, is, is lower than what you intended to um, and, and perhaps has lower efficacy because of that. Um, Model-based designs, they've been around in the literature for quite a while. This um, first paper that came out um, for the continual reassessment method came out in 1990. Um, and this is kind of the hallmark paper um, by Oak Quigley uh, that defines a model-based method. And then there have been several iterations, several uh, modifications made to that. But the CRM design is really where I'm going to focus today on my talk. Um, the basic idea is now, instead of just counting the DLTs at each dose and making decisions based only on what we saw on that dose, now we're going to fit a model across doses. Um, so we will fit a model, this might be something like a logistic regression curve, um, we'll model uncertainty with a prior distribution, and then as we start to accumulate data, we can update this model with that new information and use the model to estimate our maximum tolerated dose and to figure out where we should put our next cohort of patients. Um, the nice thing about these model-based designs is they have lots of customization opportunities in terms of how you decide to escalate, um, in terms of how many subjects you need on each dose, in terms of what kind of toxicity um, or what target toxicity you're looking for. Um, a couple of points that I wanted to point out, um, a lot of times we'll see designs that have a small cohort run in. So even if you may eventually start enrolling three patients in these cohorts, sometimes we'll start um, with small sized cohorts and maybe do one patient per dose. Um, and the idea for that would be so that you can get through those lower doses quickly if you don't expect to see any toxicity issues there. 
Another thing that we've been doing a lot is um, open enrollment, which gets away a little bit from this idea of enrolling in cohorts. Um, so sometimes you're, if you're in a cohort design, you said we're going to enroll three patients at a time and then we have to wait until we know for each of those patients whether they've had toxicity or not. What do you do if a fourth subject happens to become available before you've seen all of that information? Um, and in the traditional designs, that puts you in a little bit of an awkward, awkward spot. Um, with the model-based designs, there's a very natural way to accommodate that information if you happen to put a fourth subject on. Um, so this allows a lot of flexibility in your design in terms of how quickly you enroll patients. Um, we do put some limits on that, so you want to be careful not to enroll a bolus of patients on a dose before you determine that it's a safe dose. Um, so we do put some restrictions on that, um, but this is a nice way. I think this is attractive to clinicians who are running the trial because they like knowing that if a patient becomes available, they have a place to put them. Um, I wanted to give you an example of what a CRM might look like. Uh, so this is a trial where we have eight doses that we're interested in. Um, the dose was ranged from one milligrams up to 34 milligrams. Um, it turns out on the log scale that if you take a log of those doses, they're generally pretty equally spaced. So in terms of modeling, you could model them just as doses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, the dose limiting toxicity, typically this is defined as some event that occurs within the first cycle of treatment. Um, this might be within the first three weeks of treatment, for example. And our goal here is to find a dose where the rate of dose limiting toxicities is less than 30%. So that's our target. Um, we're going to construct a model for the dose DLT relationship. Um, we'll work on essentially doing a logistic regression model. So the logit um, here, this is pi is your probability of a DLT at dose D. And we have this logistic regression model. So the logit of, of pi is equal to alpha plus beta D. Uh, and then we put prior distributions on the alpha and the beta. Certainly these are things that we need to be calibrated. Can I ask you a question? Sure. How do we even decide on the priors? Yes, that is an excellent question. Um, and it is an art as well as a science. Um, there's a lot of calibration that often needs to happen, um, and a lot of way, times the way we do that is running simulations. So um, you know, we'll run simulations and see, we'll look at the example trials. I'm going to show you an example trial now and show, you know, if you see this data, here's the decisions that it makes, um, and then look at the operating characteristics. How often does it pick the right dose? Um, and then as you start to look at those, you might decide, well, I need to go back and tweak my priors a little. So there's, we often find there's a lot of iteration in that. Um, so here's <laughs> the grass enough prior. Here's an example of what the prior um, kind of looks like. This is what the prior mean of that curve looks like. Um, so what we're going to do in this trial is, um, based on the observed DLTs at a given time, we'll update that model. Um, I'm going to calculate a few different quantities. So I'm interested in, of course, the, the posterior distribution for pi, which is the probability of DLT at a dose. Um, I'm also interested in the probability that the DLT rate is less than 30% at a dose, and I'm going to call that the probability that the dose is safe. Um, and finally, I'm interested in the probability that each dose is the MTD, or the maximum tolerated dose. And then these quantities, we're going to use those to make decisions throughout the trial about whether or not um, we escalate uh, so here's my escalation rules. So each time a new subject walk, walks in the door, um, I can run the model to see what, what the model says according to the, the latest data that I have. Um, I'm going to say that I cannot escalate uh, to a dose that is considered unsafe. So if the probability that the DLT rate is less than 30%, if that probability is too high, I say that dose is not safe and I won't allocate there. Um, I'm going to start my first patient at dose one, um, and then patients will essentially be open enrollment, um, but I do have some constraints, which are that I must have at least two subjects with known information before I can escalate to a higher dose. Um, and I, in this trial, we had some uh, additional constraints that 
in the first six subjects, we were going to wait between each subject, um, again, for safety reasons. So we didn't enroll too many subjects all at once. Uh, and then in terms of my stopping rules, once I have 10 patients at a dose, so what that means is that the model has continually predicted that that's the MTD. So if I get 10 subjects that have been enrolled to the current dose, I will stop. And then we also have a futility rule that says, you know, if none of my doses are safe, then I'm going to stop. So I'm going to walk you through an example trial um, of what this looks like. So my first subject that came in, they were enrolled there on dose one. You can see in the upper right-hand corner. And now what we're looking at is what the model says when the second subject walks in the door. So on the left, we've got a bit of the model as well as some confidence bands. Um, not a whole lot of information here. Um, and then on the bottom right is the probability that a dose is safe. Remember, in order to escalate to a dose, that probability has to be below 50%, or sorry, above 50%. So what I'm going to do is just kind of walk you through this movie of what the trial looks like as we start to get patients enrolled. So here you can see subject two was enrolled again to dose level one. Now when subject three walks in the door, they're going to be enrolled to dose level two. Um, so that's a dose that's considered safe, and we have at least two subjects on dose one. Continuing, I'm just going to kind of thumb through these pretty fast. Um, once we get here, so you can see we've now enrolled four subjects, and we saw our first DLT that occurred on dose level two. And you can see now what happened to the model fit and what happened to our probabilities of being safe. You can see now we have several doses that are excluded. We can't escalate to these doses anymore. Um, but our model still does think that dose level three is safe. So even though we saw this um, DLT at dose level two, uh, our model is going to say that we can go up to dose three. If we were doing a three plus three design, anytime we saw a DLT, it would say we have to stick there. So we'd be, we'd be expanding at this point. And this is from the prior, essentially. Yes, yeah, because there's, there's not much information. Um, so I'm just going to kind of thumb through this. You can see what happens as subjects start to enroll. Um, now it's starting to like dose level five with several subjects there. Um, once we got to dose eight, we saw another DLT. We have one at dose 13. And typically we'll walk, look through you know, hundreds of, of these trials and look through what the decisions look like as patients are coming in, um, what the decisions look like, and also what happened at the end of the trial. So here we are at the end of the trial. Um, we've enrolled 23 subjects. Um, you can see that at dose 8, we've enrolled 10 subjects, and now that meets our stopping rule. So we've got 10 subjects on, on dose 8. It still likes that dose. That dose is safe. Um, you can see we can't go any higher than dose 8 because uh, doses above dose 8 aren't considered safe. And at this point, we would stop this trial and declare 8 to be the MTB. And this is just one trial. So then what we would do is simulate thousands of trials um, and looking at different scenarios for you know, what the underlying dose, dose toxicity curve looks like. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some results of simulations across, um, across thousands of trials. Um, so I have a scenario here. Uh, the truth is shown right here. So in the truth, remember we're targeting a 30% DLT rate. Um, so in this scenario, um, actually all of those doses are safe. Um, the different colored bars here, the black bar is the 3 plus 3 design, and then the red and green are different versions of the CRM. We looked at a couple of different versions. And what's being shown is the sample size on the top graph, and then on the bottom graph is the probability that each of those doses was selected as the MTD. So remember, the truth here is that the top dose is, is even safe. Um, so this green CRM does a wonderful job of selecting that as the MTD. Um, you can see that the 3 plus 3 design does a much worse job and actually tends to prefer these lower doses a lot more often than the CRM. Um, so, so wonderful is 35%. Wonderful is 35%. <laughs> relative to, relative, the, yeah. relative okay. to the other designs. Sorry, you're, you know my soapbox on these, that these designs <laughs> never actually pick the MTD, right? There you go. None yeah. of them. Yeah, the graph, it fools you a little bit. Yeah, the y-axis there. 
Um, so that was one scenario. We can look at different scenarios. So you know, we want to see what happens if the MTD is actually you know somewhere in the middle of the dose range. Here it's at the second to top dose. Um, and you can see, oh, the design is that right? So I think this is maybe a difficult scenario. There's not a whole lot of um, a lot of room between those. So it, uh, all of the designs tend to make a little bit lower dose here. They tended to favor eight. And we would look at different scenarios, see if we can find one. Here's where um, the MTD was towards the low end of the dose range. And when the MTD is higher, what we typically see, I should have put a summary slide in here, but what we typically see is we start to compare the 3 plus 3 to the CRM designs. And so 3 plus 3, um, as a general rule, likes to prefer lower doses. So you can kind of see that here, that um, here the truth is that this dose is the correct dose. Um, and the 3 plus 3 design still has a pretty good chance of selecting one of these lower doses. And the CRMs do a lot better job um, a lot being relative, of course, but do a much better job of picking the right dose than that 3 plus 3 does. But it depends on the fine tuning of the priors. It definitely depends on the fine tuning of the priors, yes. Right. And your stopping rules, like how do you also do that in your simulations where you look and see what end you use? Yeah, um, so I think. So you've got 15 and 10 right here. 15 and 10. Um, so I think a lot of times these phase 1 trials do have. You know, pretty strict sample size constraints in terms of budget and things. Um, and we'll play around with stopping rules. Um, sometimes we'll do, you know, if you have six subjects on a dose, it doesn't have to be 10. Sometimes we'll look at um, not only how many subjects you have on the MTD, but maybe how many you have close to the MTD. Um, I think, again, the CRM has a lot of customizability. I think they did find that a non-informative prior still beat 3 plus 3, um, but I, I think that the prior matters is what yeah, we find at least. Like you've got really small sample sizes, really small sample sizes at each dose. Um, it's probably fair to say it generally does. There's always going to be, there's yeah, that scenario that the 3 plus 3 actually works yeah. for a certain scenario. Right, exactly. Um, I mean, you can actually get a prior that approximates the 3 plus 3 over mm -hmm. some of the range, so. I'm just thinking at this early phase, a lot of times the investigators have to be able to put in what. Yes, and I think it would be we so. end up calibrating the priors based on the operating characteristics more than what the lead is. Yeah, I mean, okay. if there is data, you know, that's great. We can, we can use that, but it's, a, I think it's really hard to elicit we reverse the process where we have basically show them data and go tell us what you do what you and then reverse it and go what prior would generate what they actually want to do which has been an interesting intellectual experience <laughs> so you either can get I'll get this clinician in a box or you find out that clinician is irrational they're <laughs> 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 never irrational <laughs> I think, I'm trying to remember now, I think this was um, the CRM that required 10 patients to stop okay. at a dose and one that required 15 at a dose to stop. I think that's what those were. Um, and I think what's the here in the box, I skipped over that, but was the average sample size across the, the arms. So the CRM designs often do tend to be a little bit larger, but they're, they're getting up to a higher dose range more often. So, so can you remind me, operating characteristics are the posterior probability of success for particular dose, or? So the operating, so for a individual trial, we'll look at the posteriors, and we'll look at the, the probability that a dose is safe, and we'll choose a dose, that's the MTD. Then the operating characteristics are, okay, I simulate a thousand trials, and I'm counting how often was this dose selected as the MTD across thousand trials. 
Exactly. You're not clear. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> Those are I should These are operating characteristics, yes. So this is saying, you know, across a thousand simulated trials, the CRM looks like sample size. Um, so across a thousand simulated trials, um, under the CRM, about 50% of the trials chose dose 8. Um, whereas the 3 plus 3, that looks like more 25% can you explain the x-axis values for the top Yes, all right, so these are the truth that I simulated patients from. So I assume that the dose toxicity curve had these values as the true probability of toxicity, and then I simulated patients from that. So I just randomly generated patients from that curve. about the phase one. Okay, so I wanted to also spend a little bit of time talking about the phase two trials. Um, so phase two dose finding, so after you've gone through your phase one, you've identified the maximum tolerated dose. Um, now we usually have a few more patients at our disposal to further characterize the dose response relationship. So now we start to look at efficacy, not just safety. Um, some of the goals for phase two, um, to understand the dose response curve, and then we have to define kind of what dose we're looking for. Sometimes this might be we're looking for the dose that has the maximum effect. Um, sometimes this might be we're looking for the dose that has uh, the smallest dose that has some minimum effect that's clinically meaningful. Um, or sometimes we might be searching for what we call an ED90, so, um, some quantile of our dose response curve. I have a couple of slides to um, explain what those quantities are. So here's an example, just kind of a generic uh, shape of a dose response curve. So across the x-axis is your dose, the y-axis is your response, whatever outcome measure that you're looking at. Um, so you know, this might be a response rate or something like that. Um, so what I'm showing here are um, the, I think I had another graph, maybe I don't. Um, so if we were going to talk about looking for the, the maximally effective dose, what that would be looking at is kind of seeing where that plateau is um, and finding the dose that has that, that highest effect. Um, a lot of times what we might be interested in is finding the smallest dose that has some clinically meaningful effect. Um, and we call that dose the MED, or the minimally effective dose. Um, oh, there was my slide about the maximum. Let's just have them out of word. Uh, and then the, the ED90, what this would be looking at is if we identify the maximally effective dose, um, so that's this plateau of the dose response curve, and then I would be looking for, if I can back off the dose, but still retain a, a, a good portion of the efficacy, um, that's meaningful. Um, the idea here would be, you know, maybe as we keep increasing the dose, you might start to have some adverse effects. But if you can back off the dose a little bit and still have most of the efficacy, that may be the dose that we're interested in. So these are different kinds of quantities that you might be looking for um, in your phase two trial. And I'll show an example. So suppose that we're designing a trial in stroke. So um, for each subject, we'll be looking at their modified Rankin score. And we're going to dichotomize that. So this is an ordinal score 0 through 6. Um, but a lot of times, analyses will just dichotomize that. Um, there are certainly other ways that you can analyze MRS data. Um, but this is what we're, we'll use for our example. So uh, subject 2 has an MRS of 0, 1, or 2. We'll call them a responder. And a subject who has higher than that is a non-responder. Um, and our question here is going to be to identify the maximally effective dose. You might have other questions than this, but that's the one that we're going to be asking in this example. Um, and we have 280 subjects um, that we can use for this trial. So I'll walk through a few different uh, choices for the design that we might pick for this, uh, for this trial. I'm going to start with a basic design. So let's suppose that out of those 280 subjects, um, we're just going to allocate equally among all of our doses. Um, a lot of times you may not be able to do this um, because you have a lot of doses and resources just won't allow you to put um, all of your subjects 
across that many doses. Um, so, so we'll see how well this works, and then we'll start looking at some adaptive features to compare to this. Um, so phase two, kind of the typical steps that we might go through as we're designing our trial. Um, first is to choose how many doses we're going to look at. So in our example, we're going to look at six doses. In a traditional phase two trial, a lot of times that'll be a lot smaller, two or three doses. Um, the nice thing about an adaptive design is that you can put all of those doses in there and then let the data tell you which doses you should actually be assigning subjects to. Um, choosing an endpoint. Uh, so here we're using just a dichotomous response rate endpoint. Um, there's obviously some different choices, different ways you can analyze NRS data. Um, one thing that's going to be important is when the endpoint is measured. Um, so in RS, this might be like a 90-day outcome. Um, sometimes we might have information uh, for a patient that's available earlier. So maybe we have a 30-day MRS outcome, and we can use that to help um, inform our predictions about what their 90-day outcome is going to look like. Um, so that might be an aspect of your modeling. Um, we'll have to decide for a trial, what does a successful trial look like? Um, is that finding the right dose? Is that that a dose is superior to placebo? Um, is that something else? Um, and we'll have to decide, you know, we've got all of these doses in our trial. Um, how are we going to model those? Are we going to do some kind of dose response model? Um, and what would that dose response model look like? And once we've got these things in place, what we'll do is run simulations. So we'll choose a few different scenarios for what the truth is. Um, and what we're aiming to do is show that our design works well regardless of what the truth is because you don't actually know the truth. And so we want to make sure that our design works well under lots of different scenarios. Uh, some other things to think about. Um, I'm not going to go into these in, in the example, but some other things that might be an important thing for you to explore in your phase two um, is your population that you're going to enroll. Um, so we know that the time between when a subject is treated um, from when they first start showing symptoms is an important thing. So are you going to have some limits on your population and who you're going to enroll? Um, maybe those are limits on their time to uh, time from injury, or maybe that's limits on how severe the stroke is, um, or maybe both. Um, and then you have to decide how are you going to analyze these subgroups. Um, are you going to enroll a broad population and then narrow down? Or are you going to start with a small population? Um, so lots of things to think about in terms of which subjects do you enroll. Uh, the success criteria, so how do we decide that a trial is a success or not? Um, I think one thing that we, we want to emphasize is that a successful trial isn't just one that has a statistically significant dose. Um, identifying in phase two that you don't have an effective treatment that's a good thing. If you can prevent going to phase three, three and having a failure, um, that's a successful phase two trial. Um, to get out of a, a, a trial early is a good thing. Um, let's see, so, um, so your success criteria, again, there's a lot of different ways to customize this and to decide how you're going to decide success for a trial. Um, one thing you might be interested in looking at is the probability of success in a future trial. So if you're sitting here in phase two, what's your predictive probability of being successful in phase three and make decisions on that? Um, sometimes we make decisions based on either a p-value or posterior probability that a dose is better than control. Um, sometimes we're interested, not only is it better than control, but is it better by some clinically meaningful difference. Um, sometimes you might be interested in an active comparator. Um, if you have a dose selection criteria as part of your design, you might want to have criteria that says, okay, how confident are we that we've chosen the right dose? Um, and one thing that, again, I'm not going to go into in our example, but is not only looking at efficacy, but we're also interested in safety. So your definition of a successful trial may be some kind of utility score that combines safety and efficacy um, into a single measure. Yeah. Yes. 
I think it's probably intuitively obvious, but whenever you have this idea of phase three success, yes. you do have to predefine like what that phase three trial looks like. Yes, yeah, so you might say, um, if we were to run a 200 patient, 2,000 patient, I don't know what the numbers, but we were to run a 2,000 patient on trial, two arm trial, and if that trial was gonna be successful with a p-value of 0.025, then we could simulate forward and say what's the mm -hmm. probability we would win that trial based on the data we've seen so far. And that and that decision is going to be fairly arbitrary. I mean, you know, in terms no, of what, what you choose, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. can choose a number that I mean, knowing right now that the chance of success in the phase three trial sort of across the board is probably around twenty percent. It's a pretty low bar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is you know, our our temptation is to yeah. say I want a high predictive probability. Right. Right. Um, but what we find is, is you're not usually going to get a high predictive right. probability. Yeah, and, and, and some, sometimes, you know, you'll choose something like 40% or some of the people might are 40%. Oh, yeah, that's not sad. very, that's, <laughs> that's really high. That's twice as high as what we usually get. So that's really pretty darn good. For right? Alzheimer's, it would be like well, infinity yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> Question is then that depends on defining the same uh, clinical outcome in the phase two and the phase three, right? Either that or having a good model between between your outcomes. Yeah. 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 So we've certainly yeah. run some trials where you know in cancer this happens a lot. For example, your phase two trial is often like a responder rate, whereas the phase three is a survival. Um, so if you can build a model between response and survival, make decisions. In neurology, there aren't a ton of great models no. that so oftentimes the phase, the phase two is going to have the same outcome as the phase three. That certainly makes it easier. Uh, so when you say evaluating success, if I simply do a, this design where I'm just selecting the dose, but then run a bunch of series of statistical tests, and for some reason it comes out significant. Can I say that that's a successful? So, so I, let me see if I understand your question. So, I mean, what, you want to define your phase two trial so that it gives you the best chance possible of winning a phase three trial, right, or winning the next trial. Um, so there's several aspects of that. One is you know choosing the right dose. One is choosing a dose that's better than placebo. Um, there may be secondary outcomes that you're interested in. Um, typically, when we're thinking about success, um, we don't necessarily go down into all of those you know secondary outcomes, but we're interested in you know, the primaries that that placebo. I don't know if I understood your question. Yeah, I th I, th I think you're part. Answer my question. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I guess just the other thing is that future trial, if you're saying it's a 1,500 or a 2,000 patient trial, that's coming back to that sort of clinically significant difference, which mm -hmm. unfortunately, at least in academia, clinicians make up based on how much NIH is going to give them um, <laughs> um, because I mean, we shouldn't, right? But like, it, it's a little arbitrary, right? To say, like, well, I would change my stroke practice if instead of 32% of people being disabled, 40% of people would be disabled. But there's lots of treatments if they're relatively safe and effective. I'd say, gosh, I mean, when we talk about TPA, if something was 2 3% better than TPA, considering how many patients it's being given to, that would actually be clinically meaningful. The issue is that every single biostatistician and clinician who does clinical trials knows that that's going to be a 10 to 15,000 patient trial. And that right now, an ANDS is not going to give you money to improve upon TPA for a 10 to 15,000 patient trial. So clinical significance on a binary outcome is goofy. And it's, it's, it's very it's hard. hard. And, and defining that is really, it's, kind of said it's, a, it's a numbers game. So you know, most, if you look at, for heart attacks, for example, you know, I think most people in this room would be said we would get aspirin or get a clot busting agent for a heart attack. Oh, I'd much rather get a clot busting agent. It's going to be so much more effective. Actually, the absolute percentage difference in death, whether you get aspirin or whether you get a clot busting agent, is, is about 1.8%. So it's really small. <laughs> and they had to do a whole lot of patients to be able to show that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's 
still a point of the need for one of those leads that's really widespread. Right, it's still like to have that. But it took Tens of yeah, yeah. tens of thousands of patients yeah. to to determine that. Yeah. All right. So going back to my example here. Um, so my example, we've got a dichotomous outcome. We've got six doses. Um, so typically, we might be thinking, you know, I want to do a type one error controlled trial that's going to have, you know, if you were thinking of a frequentist test, maybe a p value point of two five. Um, we're doing a Bayesian version of that, so I'm going to look at a posterior probability that the response rate on a dose is better than placebo. Um, so, you know, if you were just going to take the inverse of that, that p-value, you could get a 0.975. Um, we do have multiple doses, though, here, so because of that, we have multiplicities that we're going to need to adjust for. So we can't use 0.975 as our threshold for success. So I've done some calibration and found that I can use a, a threshold of 0.992, and that will control my type one error rate accounting for those multiple doses. So I set up a, a set of scenarios here that I'm interested in looking at. Um, so you can see on, on the rows are my different doses, and I've set up like seven different scenarios that I want to test my design under. So in the first row, I've got a null scenario where all of my doses are exactly the same as placebo. They have a 20% response rate. Um, some of my scenarios, uh, so CSD and positive, um, these have a benefit. You can see going up to 40% in this positive scenario, only up to 35% here in the CSD. Um, in this particular example, um, there was reason to believe that the dose response curve may not be monotonic. Um, in particular, the idea was that as you started to give more of the drug, you would start to see adverse effects, maybe patients would start dropping out. And so they thought it's possible that the best dose is actually somewhere in the middle of the dose range instead of just being strictly at the top. So we wanted to test that scenario as well. Um, and we even have a scenario here at the end where the best dose is in the lower part of the dose range. So we're going to test, we're going to run some simulations across all of these different scenarios. Um, here's just a picture of, of what those looked like. Um, and so now what I've done is I've just run simulations, a thousand trials, um, which is a fixed trial. I didn't do anything adaptive. I just enrolled 280 subjects. Um, I, I randomized them equally among all six of my dose arms. And now what I'm characterizing here is across those thousand trials, how often did I have a dose that was successful? So how often was there any dose that had a posterior probability of bigger than 0.992? Um, and what you can see is that you know, even in our, our scenarios where we improved from 20% up to 40%, um, our power is not very impressive, only about 52% here. Um, the second column here is showing the probability that I selected the right dose. Um, so again, not terribly impressive. 30 to 40 percent of the time. Um, here in the low best, it actually did um, a little bit better there. Um, so this design, we did talk about that it was calibrated to have type 1 error rate less than 5 percent. Um, maybe got a little over enthusiastic there because uh, we're, we're well under 5 percent there. So now what I would like to do is say, can we do better than this if we add in some adaptations? Um, or first, what I'm going to do is add a dose response model. Um, so what we would like to be able to do is instead of analyzing each of those doses independently versus placebo, is to recognize that you know, there's some kind of smoothing that we can do between the dose arms. Um, in this case, because we, we don't uh, assume that we have monotonicity, um, that restricts what kinds of models we can consider. So we don't want to consider, let's say, a logistic or a, an Emax model, which assume monotonicity. Um, what I'm going to do here is assume a normal dynamic linear model. Um, so what this will do is share information between adjacent doses. Um, and it will tend to do some smoothing. And again, this is one of those things that requires calibration to decide how, how smooth do you want to be between the doses. So I'm showing you some results after, after some iteration here where we've, we've done um, a lot of looking at that. 
So now what we see, again, this is across 1,000 simulated trials in our different scenarios. Um, our type 1 error rate, um, we had to do some calibration because we put on a dose response model that actually naturally corrects for some of those multiplicities that we had from having multiple doses. So now instead of comparing to a 0.992 threshold, I was able to lower that down to 0.984 and still control my type 1 error rate. Um, so this is one of the benefits of doing a dose response model is under the null scenario where there's no benefit, um, you can reduce your type 1 error rate with the dose response model. Um, some other things we see is we see some improvements in our power. So in the positive scenario, we went from 52% power up to 69% power. So still not necessarily very impressive, but we did do a lot better. Um, the probability of choosing the right dose remained about the same. All right, now what I'm going to do is do some adaptations. So now instead of assigning subjects equally to the seven doses, let's do the following. Um, so at the beginning of my trial, I'm going to enroll equally between my doses for the first seven patients. So I'll put 10 subjects on each arm. Once I've enrolled those first 70 subjects, now I'm going to do an interim analysis. I'm going to take a look at what that dose response relationship looks like. And now going forward, I'm going to adjust my randomization probability so that I'm going to start allocating more subjects to the doses that have the higher probability of being the best. So um, there's some bells and whistles to this, um, which I won't go into a lot of detail about, but what we're gonna do is, in, um, is we'll do these interims, say, every four weeks. So every four weeks, I'll take another snapshot of the data, um, I'll decide what each dose has the probability of being the best, and I'll adjust my randomization probability. And then I'll walk you through a quick movie of what that looks like. Um, so just to orient you on the graphs here, here's my allocation. I'm seeing here at the first interim, so I've got 10 subjects per arm. Um, I've got a curve showing my, my dose response model, the fitted model as well as kind of the, these are the raw data. And you can see the smoothing that's happening with my model. Um, I'm looking at the probability that each arm is better than the placebo and the probability that each arm is the best arm. I'm just going to thumb through several interims of this. And you can see now, if you keep your eye on that left panel, that it's starting to prefer dose 10 and 25. Um, you can see that it's starting to allocate more subjects to those arms. Now it's starting to like dose 25. And now here we are at the end of the trial. We've now enrolled 280 subjects. You can see it really liked um, these two doses, 10 and 25. Um, and we ended up with about equal number of patients on the placebo and on our, our best arm. Um, and we can see what the probability is of being placebo on that arm. So now what we've done is we focused our resources on the doses that are doing better. We stopped enrolling patients to these, these doses that are unlikely to provide benefit for them. And we started to focus on resources on the better performing arms. So, just to wrap things up quickly, um, I'll show you the operating characteristics. Now comparing um, our response adaptive randomization trial. Um, again, we've, we've got control of type one error under 5%. And if we look at the power, you can see again these improvements. So we improved almost 10% here in this scenario over the NDLM. Um, in terms of choosing the right dose, uh, some small improvements. Um, it's not, not huge improvements that we're going to see. Them. Choosing the right dose is actually a really hard, hard problem. Can you remind me what the definition is for the probability of trial success? That's the, the yes. it's response the, rate. It's the posterior probability that the response rate on the best dose is better than placebo. So we're looking at that posterior probability and if that's bigger than some threshold. And the threshold changes again, so we have to calibrate it a little bit for the different designs. Um, but it, so it's looking at the best dose versus placebo. Um, quickly, this is just a plot showing the sample size. Um, so the different colors here correspond to the different sample sizes. The numbers here are the truth and the sample size across thousands of trials. So what we can see, these dark purples are where we put the most subjects. So here in the positive scenario, the truth was that these top two doses were the best, and you can see that's where we put most of our subjects. 
um, on this uh, scenario, we put most of our subjects here. Um, so again, just that idea that we put the subjects where um, they're most likely to benefit. Um, what I haven't done, um, but again, we could take this a step further and do early stopping. So you know, right now we, we have these interims every four weeks where we change the randomization probabilities, but our decision point of whether the trial is successful or not is still only done at that final analysis. Um, certainly we could uh, consider early stopping. So once it's clear that a drug works or it's clear that it doesn't work, um, you could stop involvement at that point. Um, that does introduce another source of multiplicities if you have multiple chances that you could stop for success. Um, so you would have to, again, do some more recalibration for that. Um, so I think I just, I'm kind of getting to the end of my time um, just to wrap things up here. So some things to consider when doing adaptations. Um, a really important part of adaptive trials is the time to information. Um, so it matters uh, how much information you have at home on analysis to make decisions. Um, so that's one of the things you often have to think about and have to simulate is you know, how fast your patient's accruing. Um, and that's actually a hard thing to estimate in advance. Um, as a kind of general summary of, of the early learning phase is that you know, it's worth putting the thought in ahead of time about what you want to learn from your trial and choosing the design that's going to maximize your chance of answering the question that you're interested in instead of just picking a design that's kind of off the shelf. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, what, if you, if you end up with a failed trial and you're looking back, what would you say, oh, I wish I had done? You know, I wish I would have enrolled a different dose. I wish I would have enrolled a different population. And if we can think about those things ahead of time and think about them in advance and then a design a trial that can reduce that anticipated regret um, that's the way to go um, and to build those things into the design. I don't want to take up too much more of Valerie's time. Um, so let's see if there are questions or comments. So in those adaptations, you're looking that you should have that availability of the response or some, some kind of a surrogate of that response. You need some data. Um, I mean, you certainly won't have it on everybody. So, um, but you do need either either a fair amount of data or a good model. Um, certainly we've done things on surrogate endpoints um, and longitudinal, you know, if, if my final endpoint is 90 days but I've got a 30 day outcome, if you can create a model, then that allows you to use that so earlier Something that's easier than it seems. Like, yeah. like for example, you know, in the stroke trials, somebody who ends up with an MRS of zero at yeah. 15 days, very unlikely they're going to have an MRS higher than that at 90 days. I mean, if they go back to normal, they're probably going to be normal. Likewise, if they're an MRS of 6, which is dead at 15 days, you know they're going to stay dead, right? So you got you got the ends of it sort of pegged out a lot of times early, and it's sort of the middle part that you have to try to model and see, you know, what sort of prediction you might have. But it's it seemed a lot more difficult when you started looking at some of those things and you know there's some low hanging fruit that are easier to, to plug in you know dead is dead good is good <laughs> and in between you have to decide what, what do you think the other patients are going to look like long term so, so 